I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, get started. So. All right. So um, this is the plan for today. I'll introduce myself and I'll talk to you a little bit about what I like to call my long walk with Teresa and um, some ways in which I think she's still very relevant today, despite the fact that she um, has died, you know, um, she's over 300 years ago. And um, then we'll talk a little bit about her life and her impact. And then um, we'll do a little meditation on her bookmark. So that's the plan. I hope that works for all of you. And it's just great to be able to spend a Saturday morning with all of you thinking about this as we start to head into the holiday season. Um, so I have been studying Teresa of Avila for a long time. And in fact, I've been interested in the study of history and religion for, for even longer. Um, I owe most of that to um, Rita and Mike Piovani, who um, I knew when I was going to St. Ursula's Church and Holy Child School um, many, many years ago as a middle schooler. And um, they ran a liturgy committee, took us all over. Most importantly, they took us to Pizza Hut when the salad bar was a novel thing. And we all thought that was amazing, but they have just been such a strong influence on my life in terms of um, the practice of religion, but also the, the academic and intellectual underpinnings under religion and that those two things can really um, go together. So um, as an undergraduate, I double majored in history and religion. And from there, I went to Harvard Divinity School where I did a two-year program, master's program in Christianity and culture. And that's when I really first encountered Teresa. It was a great time to be studying Teresa of Avila as um, feminists were recovering all sorts of texts about women, women in the church. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that too. But um, from there, once I started doing my graduate work, I knew I wanted to do some work on Spain. And um, I actually, my specialty is 17th century religious history. And I studied over 2,500 uh, witnesses testimonies, either in beatification and canonization cases from ordinary people or testimonies before the inquisition about whether or not they thought someone was holy, crazy, a fraud or, or what have you. And so the practice of religion and how it's understood uh, by ordinary people has always been um, something I think is important. And if you think about, um, um, different kinds of hermeneutics, um, the praxis obviously is really important. And Teresa really bridges that, um, both the contemplative piece and the action piece. And so that's some of what I hope you take away from um, this presentation today. So um, I think that Teresa is incredibly relevant even today. And I think that if you think about the difficult times we've been dealing with, um, in Teresa's own time, the much of Europe was at war. Um, they were um, exploring the new world. There was inflation. There were um, really challenging circumstances. They were facing illness. Uh, Teresa herself nearly died once. Um, they actually put the wax on her eyelids to um, keep her eyes shut. That's how certain they were that, that she had passed. And so Teresa knew a great deal about suffering and about pain. But I think you'll also see that she is an incredibly warm person, uh, a contemplative nun. She was for to be certain, but she was an extrovert. And so one of the things Teresa loved to do was to take care of other people, interact with other people, and um, was obviously, as many of you know, a, a voluminous writer and really unusual for the time, especially as a woman. So, all right, I'm going to have to collapse this so I can read. Okay, so this is a quote from her book, The Foundations. Um, she wrote several stories, but this is about um, the founding of her, of her convents and instructions for her religious order. So here she's writing to her nuns and she says, well, come on now, my daughters, don't be sad when obedience draws you to involvement in exterior matters, matters not directly related to prayer. Know that if it is in the kitchen, the Lord walks among the pots and pans. <laughs> and another one from The Foundation. It is not the length of time spent in prayer that benefits one. When the time is spent as well as in good works, it is a great help in preparing the soul for enkindling of love. The soul may thereby be better prepared in a very short time through many than through many hours of reflection. So again, Teresa here is saying that it's it's prayer is important, but it's what you're doing outside the time of prayer that is just as important. The scholar um, Tessa Balecki, who wrote the book, um, Thing Teresa of Avila, Mystical Writing, said uh, she teaches us to avoid two extremes, 
the indolence that makes us want to pray when we should work, leading to a false absorption, and the sloth that makes us want to work when we should pray, leading to workaholism. And I think that that, um, almost more than anything else, always reminds me just that we're supposed to be doing the things we're called to do in the times we're called to do them. Um, I'm the kind of person where my mind is always wandering. I'm always on the next thing. And um, Teresa here is really calling us to, to slow down and to do everything with, with intention and with focus. And if we keep doing what we're supposed to be doing, when we're supposed to be doing it, um, we can actually grow closer to God. So um, Teresa was born in the 16th century. This is um, the, the city of Avila today, which um, is famous for its, um, its walls and its towers. It was a fortified city um, in Spain and Castile. And um, at a time when Spain was centralizing its power, the, the um, Ferdinand and Isabel, when they married, um, united most of Spain and um, the court actually begins to settle in Madrid for the first time in the early um, 16th century too. And they settle in a small little cow town of Madrid um, and not in Toledo in part because the king was trying to separate his power from the Archbishop of Toledo who was um, seated in, in the city of Toledo. And so um, Avila is nearby. It's part of a lot of politicking that's going on. Um, but this was a Teresa's hometown. These, she would have known these walls, these walls very well. So just some key dates when we're thinking about Teresa. Um, if we all know that Columbus sails in 1492, for Spain, it was also an important year because the last more stronghold in Spain and Granada fell. And the Jews were also expelled from Spain um, during this time. It is a time of uncertainty about religion. It's a time of um, a lot of zealous ideas about religion and a lot of wars being fought over religion. And so um, the fact that Teresa is writing as a woman at this time is both highly unusual and um, really um, a, a gift that we have these writings um, from this really um, complicated time. So Teresa was born in 1515. Um, in 1528, her mother dies. And um, when her mother dies, she runs to church and throws herself on the ground and, and is just inconsolate for, for a very long time. Um, in 1531, she begins to attend convent school. And then in 1535, against the will of her father, um, she came from a quite wealthy family um, and she was beautiful. It was said she was gonna have her pick of men, um, that she would not be forced into a marriage, that she would have her choosing of who she would marry. Um, she enters the Carmelite Monastery of the Incarnation, which was a very well-to-do convent um, with actually a lot, quite a bit of socialization happening with people coming to visit, people dropping off gifts. Um, the nuns who were wealthier had very nice um, comforts in their cells and even servants. And these were all things that, that Teresa would um, question later when she reforms the, the Carmelite order into the Discalced Carmelite order um, in which um, they actually did not wear shoes because um, they wore sandals. And that was a sign of um, moving towards a more um, primitive church moving towards a, an opportunity to focus on God and move more away from um, the politicking and the troubles of the outside world. Um, so Teresa, along with John of the Cross, um, institute that new order. In 1539, um, she nearly died of a serious illness and was paralyzed for three years. And then in 1555, she experiences a religious awakening that eventually moves her um, to a, a life of mystical prayer and union with God. 1562, she founds her first of 17 convents and publishes her life. And then she dies in um, 1582. Um, in 1622, she was canonized a saint, and one of the reasons she's so important for my own work was Teresa's canonization um, and the mystical experiences that um, she talks about in her books sets off a wave of interest in mysticism and finding the next saint across Spain, particularly in, um, in two dioceses, the Diocese of Toledo and the Diocese of Lima, Peru. We see a lot of interest in, in mysticism, in making saints. Um, and those are the two big centers of that. Um, then I, I jump ahead several hundred years, but um, in 1970, she, Teresa was the first woman to be declared the doctor of the church by Pope Paul VI. And so Teresa joins the ranks of Aquinas and, and others um, in her ability to teach and what she has to offer to the church, which is really remarkable. Teresa um, 
uh, of Lousseau follows in her footsteps later, um, as does Catherine of Siena. In 1990 and 1991, two very important books from my perspective were published. So if you really want to know more about Teresa, I highly recommend these. They're not long and they're very accessible. Um, Jody Billinkoff published The Avila of St. Teresa about the social milieu and the time and the city of Avila. Um, in 1990, and Alison Weber published the Teresa of Avila and the Rhetoric of Femininity in 1991. And I bring this up because Jody and Alison's work um, really was seminal for my study of, of, of holiness and women in the church, but also um, because they're coming with the sort of second wave feminism, um, they really put this uh, Teresa into context. So with Jody's work on um, the Avila of St. Teresa, you can see how unique the work that Teresa was doing within that particular um, situation. But Allison's work even goes further. She is a, a literature professor. She was the chair of um, uh, Spanish, uh, Italian, and Portuguese at the University of Virginia for, for many years. And she actually um, was on my dissertation committee. She's a wonderful person. Um, but her argument is that Teresa is able to manipulate her rhetoric in a way that makes it palatable to the church. It gets her through the inquisition. It gets her, um, her writings able to be copied, published, and circulated. And Teresa's um, writing, she'll talk a lot of Oh, I'm this poor little woman. Um, please, if this is offensive to God, rip it up. And then she'll turn and say, hey, let me tell you how you get to union with God. You start like this, you do this. And then at the end, you'll see the, but remember, I'm just a poor, weak woman. I can't possibly know what I'm saying. And so she, she has this cadence to what she says, uh, the, her use of the subjunctive. Um, and, and, and Alison Weber really lays that out. And that um, key that she uncovers has been used by lots of different um scholars studying women and what their message is and how you can untangle it from the diminutives and the um, digressions and the constant asking for permission that make it seem not authoritative when actually it is. It's just a way of making sure that, um, that she could be heard. So um, rather than walk you through a long um, history of Teresa and, and many more quotes, I thought um, before we get to the bookmark, I would just give you some highlights uh, about who she was beyond what we've already talked about. Um, Teresa was of converso descent, or mean, uh, which means she had Jewish ancestry. Um, this violated Spanish sensibilities and, um, and their um, laws regarding purity of blood and made her writings more susceptible to being questioned. Um, this, in, in this time period, particularly in Spain, we start to see the language around race moving from um, just what you believe, but what your blood is. And so, and this begins um, in many ways in Spain with their attitudes towards Jews. Um, they begin to see them as a race and not just a religious um, choice. Because of course, at this time by 1492, um, Jews and Muslims, they could either convert or they had to leave Spain. And so um, one of, Teresa's ancestors had converted, but this did make her a little bit more questionable, even though her family was a very high standing. And this is one of my favorites. Teresa was a late bloomer. Um, her spirituality really began to develop in her late 30s, and she was 40 when she had her famous religious awakening. So I like to think about that um, in the sense of there's still time for all of us to have um, a religious awakening and to grow in our spirituality. Um, Teresa was a reformer. She rejected the vocal prayers that helped to sustain most convents in her lifetime in favor of contemplative prayer. And this is one of the places where you really see aspects of the Reformation playing in. So um, in the Catholic Church, there was this idea that you could pray for souls in purgatory. And if you prayed for them enough, they would be obviously released from purgatory and can go to heaven. Okay, and the Catholic Church holds on to this idea even after Luther um, begins his work on indulgences and the reforms that, that he begins. Um, but Teresa and, and many others in the church who were interested in the Catholic church who were interested in reform um, begin to look at some of their practices. Many convents at the time, they would receive money to pray for people. And so the nuns were spending a lot of their time praying for the Duke of so-and-so, somebody else's wife, someone else's mother, rather than focusing on their own internal contemplative prayer. And so when Teresa reforms the Carmelite order, she puts this emphasis on contemplative prayer. And so that does make fundraising to raise these new comments much more challenging because um, 
she's not going to be that get out of jail free card from purgatory that many of the other convents have. So she really needed people who were buying into this enterprise about the importance of an interior life. Teresa was a foundress. Um, her 17 convents strove to accept on a relatively equal basis, particularly for the time. And remember, European society, particularly in the early modern period, was very um, hierarchical. And so she sought out patrons that were always successful who would not interfere with the practice of prayer. And she sought out women to join her convents who were from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So Teresa, I think, would um, have been a big fan of um, some of the things we talk about with equity today. Uh, Teresa was a writer. She wrote an autobiography, a series of theological treatises, numerous letters, poetry, and of course the bookmark. Um, her letters really give you a lot of insight into how she um, interacted with friends, how persuasive she could be, and it just um, it's also a reminder because if you, most people read the autobiography or they read um, the interior castle, but they don't see her talking to people about, do we have enough chickens for next week's dinner and um, things like that? Or, you know, what are we going to do to make sure that um, the kitchen is ready to go in the new convent? And, and so she really does bridge that day-to-day -day mundane, doing the work with the contemplative prayer. And um, she was a mystic. Um, Union with God, um, as experienced through ecstasy and bridal mysticism, were her highest achievements. She also experienced visions, locutions, and levitations. So um, all of these are documented uh, miracles of, of Teresa. Um, and of course, um, we'll talk more about the bridal mysticism and the ecstasy, but that's probably what people remember her most for. But this, um, these visions and locutions and levitations rising up off the ground um, really influenced the next 50 to 100 years of um, mystics and um, their pretenders um, in, in the coming years in terms of what people thought Christian mysticism was. Teresa was a pragmatist. Um, she worried when her sisters became too melancholy and she would give them extra meat and dance using castanets to try to cheer them up. Um, the tedium of living in a cloistered life uh, can get long. Um, I think we all remember what that was like in the early days of COVID when no one was going anywhere. And she would see, she would give them treats. She would try to take care of them. And, and um, she really loved to dance. Um, her letters are full of mundane details about everyday life, as well as her concerns about spiritual matters. Um, she is a saint of the Roman Catholic Church, and her body was deemed incorrupt and is the source of many relics that are believed to have worked numerous miracles. Um, Franco supposedly carried around her hand um, in a box with him everywhere he went, and supposedly um, a car door flew open once, and the hand flew out and shut it and kept him safe and in the car. Um, one of many uh, Teresa stories. But her incorrupt body was... Um, highly disputed shortly after her death. And there's a great book by um, uh, Carlos Ayer, uh, another early modern historian, talking about Teresa's good death and, and the fight over what would happen with her body afterward. At one point, um, she was also giving off oils and the sisters would have to redress her. They actually stood her up in the chapel for a while, her, her incorrupt body. Um, and so there's lots of stories like that about Teresa too that are seem so strange to our sensibilities, but were really important in that early modern period when people were grasping for, are we believing the right thing and where's the security? And this was proof of, to them of um, God's continued action in the world. Um, Teresa becomes a model for numerous other aspiring mystics, mystics in the Catholic world for centuries after her death and her continuing popularity, of course, um, made her declare the do a doctor of the church. So this is Teresa's bookmark. This is actually um, her own handwriting. And um, there are lots of different variations on the um, the, the translation, but um, this is one of my favorites. So let nothing disturb you, nothing dismay you. All things are passing. God never changes. Patient endurance attains all things. Those who have God lack nothing. God alone suffices. And this was found in her breviary, so in her prayer book. And so we can guess that she um, used it often, referenced it often. And I do think this um, message is really about slowing down, not letting the worry overwhelm you um, and, and finding uh, an anchor, an anchor in God. So um, I thought that um, what we would do is take a minute and do the contemplative piece of this. And I have a, a musical selection from Teze in which they're using the bookmark for reflection. So 
as you're listening to this, I would just say, think about the many facets of Teresa, the foundress, the sister, the young girl who's lost her mother, the um, person seeking union with God, and, um, and then yet the busyness of everyday life. And so um, how do you find balance and how can Teresa help us find, find balance? I need to, and I'm hoping the commercial won't play. I tried to get it. You know. Are we not getting any sound? Not at this point. Let's start over. All right. There we go. It's just going to be fighting me here. You had it for a moment there. Well, yeah, I did.
So I hope that um, gave you all a chance to just reflect a little bit on, on the words from, from Teresa. Um, it's just a beautiful piece of music and there are several um, different examples of the way that that prayer has been put into um, put into music and or put into and used for different kinds of meditations. Um, I, as I was looking around preparing for this, there's a really lovely one by the, the Sisters of St. Joseph um, that on, on Teresa and, and what it can give to them in, in their life and talking a little bit about some of her other writings as well. So if anyone's interested in that, I can send the link on for that. And, and that was a great thing for, for me to find since the Sisters of St. Joseph were amongst my first teachers. Um, you know, this is Bernini's Teresa of Avila, um, a Baroque statue. It is, if any of you have seen it, it is epic in its proportions. Um, you can find it in Rome at the Church of Santa Maria della Vittoria. And, um, you know, Teresa is often remembered for this statue, is this moment of mystical union with God in which, uh, which has very um, sexual overtones. And, um, you know, she looks so passive in this. And while I love the, the description and how it matches with what she wrote in her autobiography, um, a lot of Teresa scholars really struggle with this because it doesn't show her activity. Um, but I do think it can represent from Bernini the way God was acting in Teresa. But I think it's also important to remember the ways in which Teresa was a, a woman um, who had subjected her life to God, but also believed in the importance of being an actor in the world and that prayer would fuel that action and the changes that she was able and willing to make. Um, you know, after finishing my doctorate, I um, left um, academia to work in um, independent schools. And so I've been, this is my 18th year working in independent schools and I'm currently the upper school director at an Episcopal all girls school. And, um, you know, it's been a difficult time to be in schools. It continues to be a difficult time. Um, but I always find a, an anchor in Teresa. Um, I was lucky enough to hear my Angelou speak once and she talked about the importance of memorizing poetry because these were the things that you could write on your soul and you could pull on in hard times. And I think Teresa's bookmark can be that um, for, for many of us as we um, face these complex times together. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I never know how deep you wanna go, how much history, how much of the, the, the creepy stuff with the uh, levitations and things like that you wanna talk about. So I'm happy to answer that or tell you what it's like to be at an Episcopal high school in the midst of COVID and um, uh, a lot of backlash. So whatever you'd like to talk about, I'm just happy to share. And I'm just so grateful to have this time with you and, and to hang out with my, my old friend, Teresa. So thank you. Thank you, Laura, uh, very much. Uh, wonderful presentation. It's uh, leading me to want to look up and learn a lot more about Teresa. Uh, I have to confess, in the uh, Celtic daily prayer book that we use in I order, uh, her bookmark is in there as part of our noonday prayer. I didn't know it was hers. <laughs> so thank you so much for uh, your presentation. <clears throat> and uh, this is an opportunity if you would like to raise your hand, and we've got a couple hands raised already uh, to ask questions or share a thought. And Mike, uh, you would go first, yeah. please. I think great. Well, Grace, you were first, weren't you? I don't. I don't know. Go ahead. Okay. Oh well, I just. I think the music was lovely, and this is a great, a uh, wonderful presentation, Laura. This is just fantastic. I. Um, the music was very lovely. This chanting, um, but it it it, it it's it's um, maybe different. Maybe, maybe it's not really what I think of contemplative prayer now. I mean, and she, you said also that she she went away from the vocalization mm -hmm. uh, to a more uh, quiet. I think of it as maybe as more centering prayer, where we're focusing mm -hmm. on a particular um, spiritual image. Than, than contemplative prayer. Was that different in her time? Or what would you say about that? I, 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 I think she would agree with you. And I think she would say too, that it's not that all vocal prayer is wrong, um, but I think when vocal prayer um, and using that as the, the primary purpose of women in a convent, 
um, was not producing the spirituality that she would have wanted. Um, you see Erasmus and others, you know, calling for the same kinds of reform, uh, moving away from things that are transactional and to something that's deeper. And so, um, you know, certainly she's going to go to mass and she's going to say the Lord's prayer and she's going to do all of those things. Um, and the musical uh, piece, you know, I think is more, is a lot for us to calm us and center us. And then there's all that interior work to be done. So this is not an, you know, the, the bookmark and being set to music, I do not, it, you know, obviously it's not an example of contemplative prayer, but it can be um, a conduit to, to, to settle and, and to reach it. Thank you very much. You. Uh, Grace, this is your opportunity. Yes, thank you so much for, for, for presenting to, to us today. I don't know where you are, but um, <laughs> uh, if, wherever you are, we're glad to have you with us. Um, uh, do you have published work on Teresa that, that, that we could uh, look up? Uh, I, I wish. Well, you, there, you can look at the first chapter of my dissertation where I talk about it. But um, one of the stories of my life is that um, I finished my doctorate. I had a tenure track job for a year at Villanova University. Um, but my husband was living in D.C. and um, we found out that we might have trouble having a child. And I'd, we looked at each other, I said, we're either going to be pregnant next week or we're gonna, it's going to take a long time. And I was pregnant the next week. Um, and, and we'd had to get to the same gate, same city. And so that's when I left, um, higher ed and I moved to, um, to, um, teaching high school. And so I've done little pieces on Teresa here and there whenever somebody lets me, but, um, between two kids and um, a busy job and then move, becoming the upper school director here, there hasn't been a lot of time. I do recommend if you want to know more, the two books that I talked about in the beginning, Jody Billingkopf's The Avila of St. Teresa and Teresa of Avila and the Rhetoric of Femininity. Um, and Alison Weber continues to be just a tremendous person in my life. She's, she's up there with Rita and Mike, like they're, they're all in the same group. Um, and she is prolific as is Jody on, on these topics and they can take you pretty much anywhere else you'd like to go. Good. Thank you. And I'm in Richmond, so Virginia. So on a beautiful fall day, can't complain. Lived in DC for quite a while. Thank you, Grace and Vince, you're up next. Vince, you're muted. Not me. Laura, that was terrific. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Um, I, I think we're in the midst of, of learning more about mysticism in our book group. So hearing that there's another writer that we should seriously consider is great for us. Um, the, the question I had is, could we get a copy of that uh, bookmark so possibly you could send that to Rita or Michael. Sure, um, the 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 slide you um, I mean, you can find it anywhere online, but I think there you know we can take it out of the slides, and I'm happy to share that. Yeah. Great, it's beautiful, and I love Thank it when you. it's in her own handwriting. That to me is yeah. the the coolest yeah. part. And I would say, you know, as, as you all are exploring mysticism, I mean, I'm sure I I would just you know Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross. I think are two of the most practical down to earth um, windows into this. I, I like them better than Ignatius, but that's just, that's just me. Um, I also think that, you know, when, when John of the Cross talks about the dark night of the soul, I just think that that for people of prayer, when you hit these periods, these dry spells or where you really feel stuck, it's great to remember that even, even the saints have them too. And that that's part of the process. And that's what makes those moments of, um, mystical attainment so special because they are they are fleeting um even even for the best practitioners thank you uh caroline oh i um this is wonderful this is the first time i've i've been on um cst and it's funny i was reading in my email and i, I wrote this in the chat uh, my um confirmation name um, was chosen from St. Teresa of Avila. And I never knew why. Um, and so um, it was sort of serendipitous to sign up on this. I, I, um, I guess now I know why. <laughs> it's kind of cool. So I really want to uh, 
to learn a whole lot more about her. Um, it's funny how we go through these religious processes when we're children and don't, you know, it's like pick a name. Um, <laughs> and uh, so thank you. It, you've um, opened up a whole new, uh, a whole new avenue okay. for spirituality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Michael? Let me go. Well, let Meg go first and then we'll go. Go All ahead, right. Meg. Uh, thank you, Michael and Rita, because my questions, I'm sure, will be much more mundane than yours. Um, Laura, I too, this is the first time I've been on CST, um, and I, I'm so happy that you were the topic for my first introduction, because it was fabulous. Um, I was raised Catholic, and uh, I will admit freely that I come with all of the Catholic um, Uh, the first word that was going to come to mind was baggage, but it, it's actually not baggage. It's the gifts mm -hmm. of the Catholic Church. Um, so I, um, I believe in all the Marian events. I believe in some of the great saints, um, of which Teresa is one of them. Um, she's extraordinarily special to me because I have a sister who has a, a very painful extraordinarily rare degenerative disease and her favorite prayer is the let nothing disturb you <laughs> sorry it'll make me cry um let nothing frighten you um all things pass away so that's the one that i always think of when i think of um saint Teresa. um this one the let nothing disturb you let nothing frighten you um I've had on my um, iPhone, because I have a list of maybe uh, eight prayers that I keep with me always. Um, I also have prayers I laminate for my friends and family, including both of these prayers. Mm -hmm. um, but I never actually realized that this was her prayer, nor did I realize it, uh, its significance to her. I just found it one day um, and I thought, oh, I love this prayer, how calming mm -hmm. it is. Um, the question I have for you is I have been in recovery for a very long time. And in my early days of recovery, I was, my husband and I used to live on a boat. And so I tried to tackle the interior castles because I couldn't always get to a meeting. And 14 years later, I have still failed in <laughs> tackling the interior castles. And I suspect it's because I'm not ready yet um i don't believe it's that i'm stupid i just think mm -hmm. that i'm not there yet um so i was wondering if you had a suggestion on a uh the yellow book for dummies for <laughs> your castles yeah i think you know Teresa is she's more accessible than a lot of the um scholastic theologians by a long shot but it's still you know it, it takes it, it takes some patience to to get through um patient endurance, as you might say. Um, Tessa Balecki's book, The Mystics, um, I have it in the slides earlier, uh -huh. um, but her name is Tessa, T-E-S-S-A, -S -S and it's Balecki, B-I-E-L-E-C-K-I. -E -E um, she has a, a nice, really, um, reflection on Teresa, but it's also fairly meaty with some really good history in there too, but that might serve as a nice guide for getting through it. Um, Teresa's works are all in a collected, collected volumes now. They're easy, easy to get, um, but there's, there's, there's a lot of them. So um, I, I might start there and that might help guide you. Um, the other piece is, is um, if you, have you read the autobiography? No, not yet. Her autobiography, you know, you have a more of a narrative there and she uses um, the water metaphor um, for um, moving through um, phases of prayer. And um, there's four different phases in there. And so um, you might try that as well if you want something that's a little bit more narrative rather than just, um, you know, um, more of a treatise on something. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you, Michael. I think you're going to be next up. You're going to go first? Oh, you go first. <laughs> Hello, Laura. Hi. <laughs> I miss 
when we used to get together. I really do. They were great times with the whole crew. So thank you for the memory. But one of the things I really wanted to thank you for was how you've let Teresa become a friend that walks with you, uh, not just an intellectual uh, persona, but her whole being. You can, you know, in, in your presentation, you, you made her real for me because she is real to you. And, and I, I just want to, first of all, thank you for that. But one of the things that I find that any of the mystics, um, starting with Hildegard, Julian, you know, uh, John of the Cross, obviously, but that tension between being and doing mm -hmm. is always the key to how do we integrate them into our lives, you know? And um, I really thank you for raising that today to keep playing with it. Like uh, sometimes I'm afraid we, we want to just resolve it mm -hmm. and say it's one way over the other when really um, I believe in a playful God, as you know, and I think God wants us to just play with this stuff and not take it so seriously that we feel we have to go one way or the other but to integrate them and enjoy the struggles that come along, the successes that come along, the doubts that are there, the questions that are there. So I just, I just thank you. You are an amazing young woman. And the, the real question I have for you is this. You talked about Julian being an old friend. What's your old friend teaching you today? And in particular, I know you have a daughter who's getting ready for college. What's Teresa teaching you? <laughs> well, I would say, you know, it's interesting you brought up the friendship piece. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find this, this quote. Teresa actually um, refers to God as, as a friend. And, um, you know, when she was making the, her last foundation, um, she was walking, it was not going well. It was very complicated. Um, she, you know, they, she, they were facing a life threatening flood. Um, you know, they're walking through water because they would often try to enter the convents at night. So they wouldn't have to, um, be seen and deal with some people who may not have wanted them there. And um, she complains, Lord, I'm in so many ills. This comes on top of the rest, the, these rains and the, the flood. And a voice answered her, Teresa, that is how I treat my friends. To which she retorts, ah, my God, that's why you have so few of them. You know, <laughs> I mean, and that's, that's Teresa. You know, she is, and I, I think, you know, and I, I, well, as a historian, I think one of the things I love about being a historian is you realize that all these people are people. And they come with their own baggage or past or personal experiences and loss. And, um, and that makes you appreciate what they do even more. Um, and it also makes me wonder sometimes like, what's the next generation gonna blame us for? You know, what, where, where are our blind spots? Um, because we can see there so, so easily. So I think that that's important. I also think the point you bring up about, you know, the integration of the mind and the body, um, you know, if, if we can all avoid, you know, Cartesian dualism and say that, you know, it's all about the life of the mind, um, we'll, ha we'll be healthier and happier. And, um, you know, I think about our young people today, since that's with whom I spend most of my time, you know, the pressures on them are extreme and for many of them a year apart from seeing folks has delayed a lot of them in terms of their social development particularly our preschool and elementary school kids and um you know learning is great but it's only as great as you're able to tend to the health of the body and so when those things are in are, are working together and when we're doing the things we're supposed to be doing and present in the moment i think that's when you know 
God can has a better chance of working through us rather than trying to separate the mind from the body. You know, to do contemplative prayer, you have to still the body and still the mind, right? And um, it's not one or the other, it's, it's both. Um, and, and it's a false dichotomy because how you're feeling is gonna affect how you think and how you think is gonna affect how you feel. Um, having a high school, some, you know, 95% of the time, um, the 5% that they, everyone tells me is a reminder that they're leaving and you go, oh, maybe it will be better. There will be some things will be better when they're out of the house. <laughs> um, cause she's kind of a lousy roommate right now. She's, um, <laughs> leaves things everywhere. She's taken over three rooms. Um, so I have two daughters and they're both, um, wonderful kids. I mean, we are, we are so lucky. They are good students. They're involved. They're thoughtful. Um, and so, you know, actually things have been pretty calm on our front. You know, we, we have a lot of the conversations she knows there's financial limitations. She's doing a lot of applications, um, and trying to do 20 other things at the same time. She's a serious dancer and, um, she's also doing, a engineering internship with, um, the, the professor is, is it creates like sutures and things that can be used in eye surgery and they're with cells. And so they're um, biodegradable. Anyway, that's about as much as I know about it. So she's doing that too, but um, enough about Hallie. No, she's, she's good. I, I think for me, what has been harder is the last year of, was a lot of parents being very frustrated with us as a school for not being able to give them what they felt they deserved. And that you know we weren't taking these things away we were trying to put as many things in front of them so that was very very taxing last year this year's better because everyone's getting everything back but um we we are having a lot of um pushback from some parents in the community particularly in the middle and lower school who are challenging books in the library who are saying we shouldn't be teaching values who really don't understand the episcopal church um and so that's been that's been a big challenge this year so um my kids are awesome those and and teaching still is that's the best part of the day because I'm not in a meeting um I'm just in class but um you know that's the work to be done and there are people who have done this work in difficult times whether it was when St. Catherine's integrated or in the civil rights I mean but this is where you know our work is now so yeah thanks for asking so um for me to the rest of the group, what you're hearing today in Dr. Laura Wolf was Laura Wolf at 11 years old. She has not changed, has not lost a beat. Her brilliancy, her creativity, all of that. Um, she's so dear to me because I never taught her as much as she taught me, especially when she was younger. She created liturgies when she was 12 years old and got a Monsignor and the Roman Catholic Church to do whatever she absolutely said because she has the conviction, the very same conviction as her best friend, Teresa. She really does. That's my praise for Laura. My question for Laura is, and you probably can expect this one. So here is Teresa completely trapped in the Roman Catholic Church but she is truly, I believe, a saint for the ages and for all people. So if you were to figure out a way besides writing that book when the girls are both out of the house, how do you make Teresa accessible to those people who get so put off by religion that they wouldn't go near her simply because she was a nun and because she's considered Roman? <sighs> You know, that's hard because, I mean, Teresa really was a defender of the faith. I mean, you know, she, she, she um, there's an interesting um, couple of letters. I was just talking to Alison Weber when I saw her the last time she has a, an article that she's going through the jurying process about it, in which she has a, a conversation with a woman who is a pensiata. She's a, a penitent because she had been drawn to uh, Protestantism. Mm -hmm. And, and Teresa is like all, you know, very eager to welcome her back, but she, Teresa has to be very careful because of course she's got her converso descent. There's this woman, you know, but she, Teresa was interested in having the conversation with everyone. Um, I think Teresa transcends the Catholic church in the sense of being a woman writing about these things, 
at a time when very few women were able to do so. Um, I think she lays out a path that can be followed by many. It, it's her approach to prayer is, is very grounded and it's very practical. Um, and then, you know, it's, and, and I think that's, that's her long-term gift. And I think her other gift is that it, it's this piece that I think, you know, sorry to all the men who are here, but women get that need for that, that, that there are things that have to be done. And she, another metaphor she uses is the Martha and Mary. You need to sit and pray and listen, and you need to do things because both things are important. And it's about the balance of the two. And I think she really gets in her writing. You don't see her pushing away the work. You see her saying, I got to slow down and, and embrace the work so that I can do the prayer. And um, I think that is important for all of us, everyone. Um, and it has, you know, it resonates with some other things we see in, you know, Buddhist contemplative practices and things like that as well. Um, but, um, you know, she's ours, she's, she's, she's Christian and, and, and her um, prayer life is, is other focused. It, it's on the focus is on God. And um, I think that's a powerful thing. And I think that that speaks to the broader Christian community. And I think that's where you see places like Taze and others that are more ecumenical picking up on her. I'm not sure what she would say about us, about a bunch of Episcopalians sitting around talking about her. That would be, that would be, that would be interesting. I'm sure she would have an opinion. That's the one thing I'm sure of. Good. A any other thoughts or questions? Well, again, thank you so much. We've been blessed to have you telling us about Teresa. And uh, I look forward to learning a whole lot more about her. And again, Great. and I'll um, get some uh, those resources to y'all in an email and you can share them out then too. Good. Okay. I'd like to put forth a, an idea down the road, and that is that maybe having you actually lead our course on Teresa at some point down the road for us would be just wonderful, I think. And I think we'd have a number of people who would love to be a part of that. So something just to think about. <laughs> Good. So it's great. This is a gift to me. So just I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you so much and blessings. All right, everyone, uh, we are finished. Uh, this will be is has been recorded and it will be uh, available fairly soon on our website. So if you want to to actually listen to it in more depth again, it'll be available. And again, Dr. Laura Wolf, thank you so much for being with us. Thank Blessings, you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. God bless.